Hello, I'm Kathleen Connors de Laguna and I work for the Office of International Foreign Language Education. And today I'm going to be filling in for my colleague Carolyn Collins and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about our la language resource centers. And also want to remind all of you that the slide presentation can be found by looking at the top of your screen. There's a connection to pull it down if you'd like a hard copy. And any questions that might occur to you during the presentation, please feel free to go to the bottom of your screen and um, fill them in the chat box and we'll take them at the end of the presentation. So let's get started. Today we're going to be discussing the purpose of the Title VI Funding and Language Resource Program. And we're going to talk about the different activities related to that program and what we call the JIPRA performance measures. We're also going to talk about uh, the upcoming fiscal year 2018 competition. And um, we'll be delving into that a little bit more and the potential notice inviting applications to apply for these programs. So sit down for the next 40 minutes and here we go. The Title VI programs of the Higher Education Act were created by the National Defense Education Act with the purpose to build language and area expertise because of national security concerns. Over time, the program has shifted to emphasize language and area studies as a matter of general educational importance. So the purpose of this funding uh, and throughout the workshop today will we'll focus on um, some examples of current grantees who have been awarded the Language Resource Center grants. But as you see, we're supporting centers um, and we're awarding studies in language training, creating foreign language instructional materials, promoting access to research and training overseas. Specifically for the Language Resource Center program, that was um, became uh, into, came into being when the Title Six Higher Education Act was reauthorized in 1986. Congress established the Language Resource Center, which I'll frequently return, uh, refer to as LRCs uh, in government style using acronyms, but please it, it means the Language Resource Center, so bear with me on that. It's one of the um, 10 Title VI international education programs. And again, it was designed to increase the capacity of students in the United States to communicate effectively across our borders. As our workforce and marketplace become increasingly global, the need to train students to communicate and collaborate across cultural and language boundaries is more critical now than ever. Since 1990, the LRC program has provided grants for establishing, strengthening, and operating centers that serve as resources for improving our nation's capacity for teaching and learning foreign languages, also through teacher training, research, materials development, and dissemination projects. Here's some um, thing to think about. I want you in these next few slides of uh, what the LRC programs have to include and what they may include. So language resource centers uh, must effectively learn to, or attempt to communicate the availability of their activities, programs, and resources with the greater community. Some examples of ways to do this are, um, one, publishing language learning models um, to the entire post-secondary uh, education community, or another way could be by connecting with K through 12 language programs, or a third way could be in the community outreach efforts uh, letting people know about activities and making a link between advocacy, awareness, act types of activities with the importance of emphasizing foreign language acquisition and how it helps improve all the entire effort. Again, some LRC programs that you'll hear about in other, work other panels throughout this workshop will focus on research on new and improved te teaching methodologies, or they could talk about uh, development of evidence-based materials that their pro grant programs, grant-funded programs have helped them um, develop, development and application of performance testing to assess student learning, and teaching training teachers in performance testing and teaching to facilitate language learning. They also might um, include significant focus on teaching, lear student learning, needs, uh, developing um, 
materials for less commonly taught languages and developing materials for the K-12 foreign language teacher population. And another way that LRCs have been com contributing to the greater knowledge base is through their intensive summer language institutes. These um, programs are designed to either uh, train advanced foreign language students, they can provide professional development for teachers as well and improve uh, their language instruction for pre-service and in-service training, language training for teachers. So again, be on the lookout throughout these workshop, different workshop modules to hear a lot more about our wonderful grantees and what have they've been doing in these areas. Now I want to skip over to a government requirement um, that all government grant programs are, um, need to abide by, which is um, the Government Performance and Results Act that we all lovingly refer to as GIPRA. That was passed in 1993 and was modernized again in 2010 with the purpose of assessing and improving all federally funded programs. GIPRA requires that federal agencies document our achievements of grant, the, the achievements of our grant funded programs and specifically requires agencies such as the Department of Education to develop and report quantifiable annual and long-term measures and outcomes to Congress. GIPRA stipulates that the measures be limited in number, they be specific, have baseline targets, and they're amb ambitious measures but achievable. So I want you to keep this little discussion in mind. Later on in my presentation, I'll talk about what the applicants are required to do and what our grantees are required to do to help us um, abide in, um, uh, with the GIPRA requirements. So now we'll skip over to what you've, a lot of you have probably been waiting to hear about, the FY 2018 competition. Uh, earlier in the conference, our Acting Secretary Kathleen Smith mentioned that currently we're in a continuing resolution process uh, in terms of our grant funding and our fiscal year funding. So we anticipate in the near future to publish a notice inviting applications for the 2018 competition. But please keep in mind that what I'm sharing with you today is not uh, written in stone. That's, it could be uh, subject to slight modification, but we did want to take the opportunity to give you a good idea of what we're thinking about for the future competition and what we're doing today. So we anticipate, similar to periods in the past, that the performance period for our next round of grant projects will be 48 months, and that will run from fiscal year 2018 to 2021. Project start date, we tentatively anticipate for ne the next school year, somewhere in the middle of August of 2018, and lasting through um, middle of August in 2022. And again, um, regarding the funding, without an approved appropriation from Congress, we don't have a determination of the amount of funding that will be available at this time. But we will soon be, once we do receive that appropriation and the go ahead, we will announce the fiscal year 2018 competition schedule. And those announcements will be made much like the announcements were made for this workshop via the Federal Register announcements for the notice inviting um, applications and also on our IFL website and through our IFL e-newsletter, which we'll be providing you with those contact informations if you don't already have. Uh, and if you haven't already signed up for our IFL e-newsletter, e I strongly suggest that you do so. Going to our website, we made it very easy and that way you'll be in the loop for a lot of our future um, announcements regarding the program, this program, and many of our other programs. So regarding who will be eligible to participate, we anticipate that our notice inviting applicants will be open to all any institution of higher education or a combination of uh, collaborating institutions of higher education. And the notice uh, inviting applications, or NIA as we refer to that, will include a lot of uh, additional guidelines uh, and uh, that all applicants are required to abide by. Um, some of these include the actual submission dates and timelines for getting those applications in, your formatting guidelines, and um, many other details. So please read that very carefully once it is published. 
Whenever we do publish the um, application announcement, we um, have competition priorities. And once again, those are not yet determined for fiscal year 2018, but they will be, so please be on the lookout for those. Those are important to consider when putting together your application. What I would like to share with you today are some of the current uh, priorities for the competition that our grantees have um, abided by and um, to give you a sense of what we might be considering for future competitions. So the, um, these two, on this slide, we've featured two competitive priorities. The first one uh, are that applications that propose activities that focus on any one of our 78 priority languages from the U.S. Department of Education's list of less commonly taught languages. Those uh, applicants that include that are awarded an additional five points. And then the second preference is for applications or applicants that propose significant and sustained collaborative activities with one or more minority serving institutions or with one or more community colleges. And again, we have some examples of grantees that have done that very successfully throughout these workshops. And I urge you to um, listen to what those applicants have to say and, and listen into those sessions. Again, our current um, LRC competition priorities for the invitational priorities, um, th that may be subject to change, but to give you a sense of what they are now, the first invitational priority um, are for applications from new applicants, as we'll be defining in the Federal Register Notice. So if you're listening in for the first time today, you're not a current grantee, you're not at a disadvantage. Actually, we are encouraging you to uh, participate and apply for this next round of uh, grant awards. And then the second invitational priority are to applica applicants that propose programs or projects that engage in collaborative activities with heritage language centers or schools that support the language maintenance and development of heritage language speakers. So now a little bit, uh, a little overview of the application review process. And this is same as any grant review process. Uh, you'll notice if you've applied for other Department of Education grants, we have our own uh, list uh, our own regulations through what we commonly call to uh, as EDGAR, the Education um, General Applications um, Regulations, and they require us to go through um, a peer review process for the applications once they're received. We uh, have expert external reviewers who will look at your applications and score them uh, according to the criteria, which I'll soon present to you. And after that's done, um, we pull them together and then the Department of Education will do some further review and um, finally select those proposals that will be funded. So, the selected selection criteria for you. Dun da da! Here they are. Uh, this page is a lot of numbers, but I'd like you just to look at it and, and, and consider what, what numbers here have the highest points uh, associated with them. For example, our organizational capacity criteria that we'll be looking at, your plan of operation, your key quality, quality of key personnel, total of 35 points out of 100 baseline points. So, pretty significant. The next um, two, the next, excuse me, um, four and five are the concept, what you're applying to do, what is unique about what you're trying to do in your application. Those um, that need for a potential impact, that itself is for 20 points. So obviously, that should cue you in that we'd like to see a strong narrative explaining that part of the application. And look, going down again, uh, number seven, the evaluation plan. Once again, it's something worth 20 points. So we hope you'll look at that very closely when you're pulling together your application. And this selection criteria, the order of these is also important to help you organize your thoughts and make it easier for our reviewers when they're reviewing your application. So please keep that in mind when you're pulling together your applications. So let's drill down a little bit more into each of those criteria. Number one was the plan of operations, 15 points. In the, we need to, you to include a plan of operations for each year which you're requesting program funding. Um, so this is a four-year competition. We'd like to see a plan for each of those four years. 
And really, we need you to think that through. What is, uh, with as much detail as possible, considering the page limitations of the application, describe all the necessary steps that you want to, um, that you'll need to um, go through to reach your program goals. Describe your objectives and how they relate back to Title VI and the LRC program. Here you're going to explain what you plan to do, how you will manage the activities, how you'll leverage your resources and personnel, and um, go through that a little bit more on the next slide, and also your plans for, ac for equal access to these federally funded activities. Plan of operation a little bit more is that we want um, to look at the resources and personnel to achieve each ac objective. So the more logical outflow that you could have um, in explaining all of these, what is your objective, what are the specific um, strategies you need to eat, uh, achieve each of those objectives as it relates to each se uh, selection criteria will really help you in pulling together your application. The next, uh, I think I jumped over, excuse me. Quality of key personnel, yes, that's important that I did jump that over. We're awarding 10 points for that, and we want you to describe your project director's education experience, qualifications, and duties. We also want to see the percentage of time that that project director will be devo devoting to this project. Repeat this again for other key personnel that will be participating, and again, the time commitment for each of those. Do you have an administrative staff, um, and do you have administrative buy-in? Those are all things that we want to know about, and please, don't hesitate to provide us with as much detail as possible. And also, please uh, assure us that non-discriminatory employment practices are in place with your institution. Okay, now we're ready to look at the resources. And we want to know, with, for this criteria, are your facilities with your organization adequate to be able to conduct the operations of um, your this language resource center application that you're submitting? Do you have sufficient equipment and supplies? If not, um, how will you obtain those to make uh, sure that you'll be able to accomplish your goals? Again, this was an area of great importance in terms of our selection criteria. The extent that um, you're able to um, show us the p impact by describing are the, all the proposed materials and activities needed in the foreign languages on which the project focuses. The extent to um, which materials that you're developing can be used throughout the United States. Can we scale them up and use them broadly? And the significant contribution to strengthen, expand, or improve programs of foreign language studies. Please explain to us the, 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 the extent that your program will be contributing to these factors. Likelihood of achieving results. Provide us with a narrative that explains the how to achieve your project goals, as I mentioned. Is there evidence, is there research that supports your plan of action that you're submitting to us? The quality of your outlined methods and procedures for preparing your materials should be based in that, this, as well as the extent to which your plans for carrying out activities are practical and can be expected to produce the anticipated results. The next criteria is description of final form of results. The reviewers will closely analyze each application to determine the degree of specificity and appropriateness of the description of the expected results or outcomes for your project. So please clearly explain this to us in your applications. Again, you'll notice that the evaluation plan, this criteria is given weighted very heavily with 20 points. And we want to know how you envision that you'll be measuring and um, informing the overall management of your th program through the evaluation. So we want to see a clearly stated evaluation plan. We want to know what are your methods of evaluation and our reviewers will determine whether they're appropriate for this pro project. And to the extent possible, um, how objective is the evaluation plan and will you be producing data that is quantifiable? Is your does your evaluation plans develop outcome measures? Do you have them clearly stated? Do you draw on evaluation research? 
Now, are you using uh, a trained evaluation staff to conduct the evaluation? Describe the entire evaluation process from the beginning to the end and help us understand it. We also want you to focus on grant activities and our, your larger program outcomes. So internal process evaluation as well as the external impact evaluation. We want you to choose a definable set of activities to evaluate. Perhaps it's not possible with all you're planning to do to uh, do a huge evaluation, but please let us know what subset act of activities you will be including. Please also um, explain to us the areas uh, for continual quality improvement within the methods and the projects that you've selected. And the evaluation plan sh should be able to help you document success and, um, and hopefully learn from those activities that aren't quite as successful and be able to incorporate that in the period of performance, which we said mentioned will probably most likely be a four-year period. So what are the continual areas for quality improvement? And as I mentioned in the beginning, you might want to switch back when you look at these slides to see that all of this plan uh, is important in your application and it will be important in the implementation of your grant if awarded the grant. And it will help us meet uh, and document these, the GIPRA goals that I mentioned a little bit earlier in the presentation. The next part of our selection criteria are the budget and the cost effectiveness. We need you to provide a detailed breakout of all project costs for each year and disaggregate by federal and matching funds if you do plan to offer those. We want you to demonstrate the relationship between the project, the stated project objectives and the actual expenditures for the project. And we want you to note that um, the LRCs are allowed to generate income with the products and materials that you might be planning to produce. This would be um, noted as pro um, potential pro program income, and it will be it could be explained according to our uh, Department of Education uh, Acquisition Regulation 74.24. But essentially, it, it refers to any profit gen generated from selling materials developed with Title IV. Um, if, in funds and reinvesting those back into the grant activities. Any monies generated from these materials that were developed through our uh, grant funding cannot be used in other aspects of the institution. It must stay within your center's programs and activities. So please keep that in mind when pulling together your budget. And again, um, we want you to look at uh, equipment costs that can exceed 10% of your total grant amount, indirect cost cap, and matching funds. Matching funds are not required, but if you do plan to um, match funds through your institution, then we would need to know about that as part of your uh, budget application. Okay, performance measures. Each grantee will be expected to develop me these measures and report on their performance, which relates to the discussion I had about the application and the evaluation, and also um, relates back to the GIPRA dis um, discussion that I had where the Department of Education needs to report to Congress on the outcomes of our grant programs. So to give you a sense of the performance measures, forms that will be eventually required of our grantees. Um, it's because we need to present these data elements to, pr to demonstrate the project performance. They're used also to assess progress for us, the program officers, and the pro um, us here at the Department of Education to see how you're doing. And there are five required data elements when pulling together the performance measure forms. These are the project goal, you can have a minimum of three goals, maximum of five. Performance measures, a minimum of one per each goal, maximum of three. And also further break it down into an activity that relates to each measure. And you can, again, a minimum of one activity, maximum of three. Data indicators for each of these. We want to see it quantified as much as possible. Minimum of one, maximum of three. And then we want to pre-post evaluation. So we want to look at baseline um, and target measures throughout the period of a performance. So breaking it down a little further, for the project goal, we want to see a broad overall statement of what the project's aiming to achieve and accomplish. 
It doesn't have to cover every single project goal, as I mentioned previously, but um, three to five of the selected goals would be helpful. And um, we like to see you just limit this to one sentence. Performance measures. These are metrics to assess if the project's meeting how, or the extent that you're meeting your overall specified goals. They need to be specific and time-bound with well-defined units of measurement. They may address direct products or services delivered and or the results of these products and services. It conveys not only the what will be achieved, but also by how much, quantifying what you've accomplished. And then the activities are actions that will be implemented in order to meet your performance measures and project goals. So uh, again, short-term activities that help to reach that. Data indicators. Again, I'm sure you're noting a trend here. We want to see specific, observable, and measurable characteristics that can be used to determine whether carrying out activity results in progress towards meeting the performance measure. We look at both your internal process and your outcome performances as well. They should reflect activities and performance taken into consideration um, the different sources of data that will be available to you. Obviously, if you can't measure it, we don't want to see you putting it on your performance measure form. We also want to know a little bit more about the periodicity of the measurement. So um, will it be semesterly, quarterly, annually? That needs to be clearly specified so we're all on the same page of what, we're what you'll be measuring. And finally, regarding the pre-post, we want to look at the initial val data collection at the beginning of your project to see where you're starting from. And then each year, we want to look at plan values for the data indicators so we can measure progress over the course of the project period. These can be expressed as discrete for each reporting period or cumulative over the course of the performance period. And to give you a visual for the performance measure form, uh, this is quickly running you through that. Each of the categories that I mentioned, the measures, activities, data indicators, frequency, source of the data, and then our pre-post baseline and target year one, through four are all mentioned on this page, uh, this example that we've taken from a Southeast Asian center. So hopefully you'll find this helpful as you're pulling together this information. I want to end up with some basic application tips. Getting organized. I gave you an earlier tip that was looking at those selection criteria as a way to help organize how you present the information, make it easier for re your reviewers as well to go through the application when it's time to review these. Also, you want to contact your prog program officer early with any questions or anything that's unclear about the program. And at the end of the presentation, we're providing you with Carolyn Collins' name and contact information. You want to look at the abstracts of funded grantees from the past, and those, that those were successful proposals or of our current grantees. So those can be found on our Eiffel website. You also want to look very closely at that Federal Register notice uh, invita inviting applicants for the LRC program, the next um, funding opportunity. And you want to look again at our program websites for any updates and information and review, review all the frequently asked questions that can be found on our website. Again, that notice inviting applications that will be published in the Federal Register. You want to look back to the program statute and regulations, which you can find reference in our IFA website. Competition highlights, any additional instructions we have, make sure you're reading them and you follow them very closely Please look closely at the selection criteria that are actually published in the notice inviting applications and the budget instructions. Here are some more tips when you're writing that proposal. Addressing all selection criteria and sub-criteria. Summarizing each proposed activity and how it increases the program impact. To the extent possible, follow the sequence of the criteria list in the application. Can't repeat that enough times. And describing in detail how the program will be accomplished, who it's going to serve. Limiting your narrative to activities where you're seeking funding. Please, you can always reference other sources of funding, but please spend the bulk of your time talking about what you're asking for uh, in this application to the department. 
And last but not least, please make sure that you develop your own internal timelines to submit your application way before the deadline. Don't wait until the last minute. We know that we've got a lot of stories we can share of people that do that and run into technical difficulties and aren't able to apply. So please heed that advice, if nothing else. And your program officer for the LRC program is Carolyn Collins. She can be reached at this email address and uh, phone number. You won't be able to reach her for a little while. Um, she's out of the country right now, but she will be certainly happy to respond to you when she returns. So now I'd like to open it up for some question and answers. And it looks like we have a few. And fortunately, I'm joined <laughs> by my division director, Cheryl Gibbs, who is the institutional knowledge here at the Department of Education about this program and many others. So thank you, Cheryl. Oh, you're welcome. Our first question comes from um, Kate Bassani out at the University of Minnesota. And she's asking us, once the application announcement is published, what will be the turnaround time for submitting proposals? We try to give applicants at least 45 days to respond to uh, a notice inviting applications, but we do not have a confirmed timeline for any of the 2018 uh, activities, but again, 45 days is the minimum that we would like. Now, as things change in the government, it could go back to, it could be 30, but ideally, we would like to give everybody 45 days. So please look closely at the notice of an invitation to apply, and there it should be clearly specified for you. Okay, our next question um, comes from Julie Sykes at the University of Oregon. While we, when will we know the, um, while we know the timelines are unknown, could you give us the best idea of when you anticipate this being published and the priorities, um, when the priorities will be determined? Um, again, I don't want to be vague, but we just do not have that information to share because these decisions do not reside just in Eiffel. When you talk about competition priorities, those are considered policy directives. And so policy is, uh, requires input from offices across the Office of Post-Secondary Education. So that mm -hmm. timeline is dictated by the Office of the Assistant Secretary, the Office of Planning, Evaluation, and Development, the Budget Office, many character, cast of characters um, uh, uh, have input into the policy direction for all of the competitions that we conduct. So we cannot give you a timeline or a definitive, not even a ballpark, because our time um, is dictated by their time. And so mm -hmm. as soon as we can, and we hope to get started on these policy discussions in October so we can have moved forward to establishing the policies, the priorities, publishing them for public notice, and public comment. So all of that takes time, and so as you can see, we cannot nail down the timeline. So to broad stroke it, hopefully by late fall, we'll have something to tell the field. By early 2018, possibly we'll be able to announce the, the competition. But those are very broad strokes because um, it doesn't, the decisions do not reside only in Eiffel. Okay, thank you, Cheryl. Our next question comes from Maisa Kalib at um, UTEP, uh, and she's, Maisa is asking, what was the total score for those applicants who were awarded in 2017, but I believe she probably meant 2014, uh, perhaps, the, total the last score? competition, yes, I do you remember? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Yes, so um, we don't have that available to you, but um, I say shoot for the top, and all those extra points are taken into consideration, right, those priorities, so right. um, to the extent that someone can meet all of those, that helps definitely strengthen their opportunities to be considered. And keep in mind, every competition is different from the prior competition. So you should not uh, be concerned about the cutoff score from the 2014 competition because that doesn't factor into the 2018 competition. Okay, thank you. And the next question is from Alan Paul. Um, Alan's asking, will the performance measure forms be the same as those used in the 2014 cycle? Yes, they will be. 
Okay, that was easy. By form, you're meaning the grid that Kathleen has on the slide? Yes, essentially that will be the same, but for those of you who are familiar with the International Research Information System, which is our performance reporting system, that form, the template that's in hard copy, that information eventually gets into IRIS. The form itself doesn't go into IRIS, but the information that's on that form goes into IRIS. So when you submit the information in the application package, you use something like a table that Kathleen walked you through, but that, that form itself does not translate into a electronic form in our um, IRIS system. But to answer your question, what we're asking is essentially the same kind of information that we asked for in 2014. Okay, great, thank you. Our next question comes from um, Akinloye Ojo, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce the name, but from the University of Georgia. And the question is for new applicants, such as the, um, I believe it's University of Georgia, Athens, UGA, how much does the past activities or achievements count as the first question? And the second regards matching funds. Are these useful um, for, uh, or are they considered a positive when reviewing the grant applications? Okay, I'll take the last question first. Mm -hmm. uh, the Language Resource Center's program does not have a legislative matching requirement. So in terms of, re of stating it in that way in your application, that means that we will track that money that you say you're going to match for the project in G5. And I don't think you want that to happen. Mm -hmm. I think the better way to look at this is, is in your narrative to state how much your institution is committed to the project. So you can frame your institutional commitment not as a matching requirement, but to say our institution is very much committed to are establishing a language resource center and they are going to do it in this way but I don't want you I don't want to encourage you to use the word cost share or match because in government ease that's a totally different uh, animal and if you say you're going to cost share dollar for dollar on your LRC requests then we are going to track that in G5 and make sure that you are doing that. And I don't think that's what you mean. I think what you mean is how can we and should we articulate in our ap application that our institution stands behind this language resource center that we are proposing. And yes, indeed, you should say that and talk about it in that way. Great, and perhaps in the resources section that could be considered too as well as the selection criteria yes, of absolutely. what type of buy-in and, mm -hmm. and support there is. And what was the other part and of the And the other question? part of the question was um, the past. How much does past experience count when they're, uh, for a new organization that would be applying for this type of funding, grant funding? Uh, their past ex if so, they're um, new. For new applicants, uh -huh. how much does the past activities or achievements count? So does it count against them? Um, and so I think what we mentioned in um, the, one of the special criteria was that we are encouraging new organizations, mm -hmm. new grantees to apply for this funding. And in fact, for a new grantee that does, uh, they will receive extra points. So I think that's an encouragement that we've done for the current round of grantees. Was that, I didn't realize that we had points for new applicants under the Language I Resource there, Center. There was, there in the, there was in okay. the selection. All right, so <laughs> that. priority, I'm sorry. That was an in okay. Invitations that didn't have points. <laughs> yeah, invitational <laughs> priorities do not carry uh, any weight in the competition. And again, because we have not established any priorities for 2018, that might not even factor in. But the important thing is all institutions for a competition, whether you have had an LRC grant in the, pa in the past or you have not, the strength of your narrative and the compelling story that you are telling is that we have the resources, we have the will, we have uh, an interest in this uh, program. And so the extent to which you answer those eight or nine questions that Kathleen laid out in responding to the selection criteria, that's what the reviewers uh, judge your application by. They do not know who has had an LRC in 2014 or in the pr uh, prior years. They are instructed to 
evaluate the merit of the application against the selection criteria, and the selection criteria does not speak to whether you have had LRCs in the past. Now, in terms of an abstract, obviously, the language resource centers who have participated in the program, they're going to speak to their, their track record, so to speak, but we, they too also understand that this is not a legacy program as none of our Title VI programs are legacy programs. But you can speak to your experience, your track record, and your abstract, but when it gets to the selection criteria, the playing field is equal for everybody, whether you've had an LRC or not had an LRC. It's the institutional's commitment to the project and the extent to which you answer those eight or nine questions that is important. Great, thank you for clarifying mm -hmm. that, Cheryl. Our next question comes from Rebecca Damani at, um, I believe it's the University of Maryland. Um, I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> How important is collaboration across universe, um, units of the university? And then the second part of the question is, is it recommended to include an external evaluator? For all of these programs, it's very important to have collabor collaboration across the university because all of the Title VI programs speak to capacity as it strengthens the institution, and then capacity as you're reaching out to the broader community, whether it's a, a K, in the case of LRCs, uh, you're reaching K-12 schools, you're doing dissemination to other post-secondary institutions, you're providing professional development, you're developing assessment projects, instructional materials. So the extent to which any of those activities um, touch on various sectors, whether it's at the institution or elsewhere, those collaborations are very important because that strengthens your position as an LRC. Mm -hmm. um, and the other part of that? External, is an external evaluator required? Mm -hmm. um, the education department regulations require uh, projects to be evaluated. We do not dictate who does the evaluation, but I think it's, it's helpful to have somebody from the outside do it because they can be very objective. So you can have a combination. If you have internal expertise on your campus, a lot of institutions have uh, centers for evaluation or uh, institute for educational evaluation. If you have the expertise on your campus, obviously you should use that expertise. And then you can combine that with somebody from the outside to help um, uh, evaluate your project. But we do not mandate that it has to be um, an external evaluator. And then your budget will dictate whether you use external an, an external evaluator too, because you know evaluation is a costly um, line item. So in working with your institution and your fiscal office and your faculty support, then you, you can decide based on the design of your evaluation plan how much of it can be done externally, how much of it can be done internally or in combination. Great, thank you. Um, Cheryl, I hope that answers your question at Maryland. Um, and we have some several more questions. So um, one of them is, um, do we have a sense of the approximate level of funding at this point? No, we do not. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was easy. And another question from Meg Malone at Georgetown is um, whether um, we whether the learn the key applicant can partner with a nonprofit instead of a collaborating with other um, educational institutions. Whether that's allowed, mm -hmm. I would think it mm -hmm. is. Yes, mm -hmm. it's the language resource centers in my mind are very much like the international research and studies program in that you're you're doing specialized work either research on language research and assessment designing very specialized um, instructional materials and so the extent that you can partner with other organizations or institutions of higher education i think that supports your uh, your language resource center mm -hmm. and also the language resource centers are different from the other area centers, um, like the Centers for International Business or National Resource Centers, and that they have a very, um, they're kind of niche uh, centers in that 
You might have a language resource center that focuses only on African languages. Not might, we do. Mm -hmm. you, might ha uh, you have language resource centers that specialize on open educational resources. You have a language resource centers whose specialization is assessment. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of niches will dictate the resources that you collaborate with. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect, thank you mm -hmm. so much. Several more questions um, from Zali Mali. Uh, we have a question, will the call for uh, applications be emailed to us uh, as they've been registered here or do they have to check the website frequently? I think I mentioned that we really encourage people to sign up on the Eiffel um, to our listserv and for our e-newsletter, right? From the Eiffel website? Right, mm -hmm. but the official way to get that information is to um, through the re Federal Register. And once the register is published, we're very good at, through our communications effort um, that's spearheaded by Carolyn, we mm -hmm. send information out through the uh, Gov Delivery site. But when a call for proposal is announced in the Federal Register, we can let you know, but, um, but that's where you should look. And then we have the courtesy through Gov Delivery to send everything out to everybody. Right. But we don't maintain um, an individual email list where we say, oh, I need to send this to my best friend Meg and send it to her. <laughs> but, um, but we will get it out to the field because we don't want to also be um, perceived as having a special list of people that we're mm -hmm. informing about these competitions. Okay, I think mm -hmm. we have time just for a few more questions. So we have one from Eric Jones. Are there advantages in the evaluation if we submit a joint LRC application with another institution? Is it advantages to the I, evaluation? That's what it states, but I think that what Eric's referring to here is the selection criteria in terms of the strength of the application. Is there an advantage for an individual versus a collaboration of institutions? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to give the appearance for any of our programs that you're kind of just paper clipping yourself to someone to gain an advantage, mm -hmm. but the application itself should show the strengths for each institution or each entity that by doing this in concert or doing this as partners, then the nation gets a better um, language resource center. People will be uh, supported by our efforts or what we have to offer, doing it together if rather than doing it separately. So you need to think that through and also think through how each of you can respond to each of those selection criteria. Mm -hmm. Very good, thank you. And then the final question that I have is, um, I don't have who it's from, but it's a great question. Do we require paper or electronic sub um, submission will we require for these applications? The language resource centers, I believe, as they have in the past, you submit through the uh, grants.gov site. So that would be electronic. Electronic. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, any other um, comments or suggestions that you have to add, Cheryl, for this session? Uh, no, I think you've covered it well. Um, again, for context, it would be helpful to read the applications that are currently funded to give you a feel for what goes into that type of application. But always remember that you have your unique um, expertise. So don't read it and say, oh, I don't think I have a chance at this because of X, Y, or Z. You approach it to say that um, we do have, we do meet the purpose of the language resource centers. We have this capacity as a language resource centers, center, and yes, and yes, we can respond to all of those selection criteria in a very compelling way. And so, again, each competition is different. It's open. It's a level playing field, and um, I encourage everyone who has an interest to indeed uh, to apply. Um, and we're here to help. Yep, I second that. We look forward to receive your applications and thank you for joining us today.